there's MQ, EC2, and a red shift and game lifting glue. There's Lumberyard, Light, Salem, Work, Docs, and Work, Mail, and Work, Lincoln, Private, Link 2. Detective, Inspector, and Trusted Advisor, Cognito, Corretto, S3, Data, Pipeline, and Data Sync, App Mesh, and App Syncer, you could use SimpleDB, but don't. App Stream, Time Stream, Augmented AI, Auto Scaling, Lambda Amplify, oh, Direct Connector, Just Connect, Configure RDS. These are the major services of AWS, CLI. CDK, text track like Civis X and X-Ray, SNS as ES, SQS, STS, EFS, do your best, it's okay. Athena and Polly and Kendra and Macy, Alexa for Business Cloud 9, Code Artifact, Code Build and Code to Play, Code Commit, Code Pipeline, Code Guru, Code Star and Chatbot and Chime. Translate, transcribe, transfer family, all the many things of IoT. Oh, there's cloud formation, link formation, free RTOS. These are the major services of AWS. Honeycomb, Elemental, VMware on AWS. This key change is brought to you by KMS. Comprehend, uh, Inferent, uh, Deep Learning, Deep Razor, Deep Lens, uh, Deep Compose the Aurora, and then Cost Explorer to track your expanding expense. Uh, service Catalog, Artifact, Quick Side Device, Farm and Workspaces, Glacier is Cold, Robo, Maker, Sumerian, Kafka, Kinesis, Control Tower, Pinpoint, and Fargate, I'm told. Recognition, Fraud Detectors, Cool, Wavelength, Blockchain, Well Architected, Tool, Oh, though half of them start with Amazon for reasons we can't guess. These are the major services of AWS. Now it's time to deploy Global Accelerator. VPC, ELE, and the database Route 53. There's Compute Optimizer and Personalizer and Bridging Cable TV. There's Cloud Switching, Cloud Watching, Cloud Mapping, Cloud from Cloud Drill, and Cloud HSM. And there's SageMaker, Step Functions, Web AC, MEC, REM, RSA, RAAM. And there's Outposts and Outworks and Organizations and Snow SSO and AppFlow and Browse Station and DynamoDB and Document DB and Infinity. Thank you, Forrest, for tolerating basically me embarrassing you with the sound of your own voice if you're anything like me. I love the sound of my own voice except having to hear it later. Uh, also, thanks to your employer for both making you available and for sponsoring this entire ridiculous nonsense. Uh, thank you also to those of you who are watching. Forrest, who are you and what do you do? Well, that's a great question. And honestly, these days, after how many days of reInvent has it been? I'm starting to question that myself. But uh, my name is Forrest Brazil. I work at yeah, something like that. I work at A Cloud Guru, uh, where my unofficial external title is Cloud Bard. Basically, I help to tell the story of the cloud. And of course, ACG as a whole uh, is a vendor neutral cloud education platform. We have a couple million students now that are learning all sorts of cloud and cloud adjacent technologies uh, through us. And we're covering reInvent Fast and Furious, which is part of why I feel very tired right now. Yeah, I've been trying to pace myself as I've gone through this with the idea like it was, oh, a normal reinvent in Las Vegas, which was great, except that we're now in the middle of week two and I'm realizing why it's only one week when it's done in person and I'm slowly burning through the tenuous grasp I have on sanity to begin with. So the purpose of today's stream is to basically tear through everything that was said yesterday in AWS's inaugural machine learning keynote because they said they've never had one of those before, which I don't know if I would agree with that. Machine learning last year at reInvent took up a disturbingly obnoxious portion of Andy Jassy's keynote. What do you think? You know, I feel like uh, the interesting thing about Andy Jassy's keynote this year is so many more things made it in there that usually get relegated to the infrastructure keynotes, right? Not that uh, Werner Vogel's keynote is anything like the kids' table. He's one of the, I don't know, top 10 most impactful technologists of the 21st century. But that was always the keynote for, for builders, whereas Jassy's keynote was the one for the high-level services that you would use to uh, you know, be impressive from a marketing standpoint. And I, I really like that some things like uh, some of the changes to Lambda, like container images, made their way into that keynote. And some of the machine learning stuff found its audience in a machine learning specific Specific keynote. I thought that was a great change this year. I hope they're able to find a way to preserve some of this separation that we've seen in future because, I mean, the fact is, and I think you've acknowledged this, not every AWS service is for everyone, right? We have different interest points. Yeah, I mean, I, I find myself zoning out through most of the IoT stuff because I don't have a factory floor full of robots of which I'm aware to go through and, oh, I can put sensors all over the place. So it's clear that a lot of these services are not for me. But the question I had around machine learning is who are they actually for? Let's go through and figure out based upon what was announced, 
what they're for. Uh, the first one was clearly for AWS. Uh, they announced SageMaker distributed training. And the problem is, is that machine learning training jobs run on burning piles of money. And you weren't able to burn enough of it running a single job. So now you can spread that out and burn more money at the same time by multi-tracking it. Did I miss anything on that? Or is that basically it? So and to be clear, my, my uh, limitations on machine learning are, are limitless. So I'll, I'll uh, you know, not get too far out of my depth here. But one thing I thought was a really interesting uh, feature of reInvent so far this year, and this actually ties back into some of the pre-invent announcements as well, if you will, is that you're starting to see AWS, I feel like, target um, ML engineers a little bit, right, as well as, as opposed to just uh, data scientists. Uh, so they're starting to do some work like they did with SageMaker pipelines around uh, providing some actual tooling to help the people who have to build and maintain these things and scale them out, right, not to have to roll all that tooling themselves, because that's, that's a real pain point. And uh, as that work continues to be split between sort of the DevOps people of machine learning and the uh, data scientist people of machine learning, uh, AWS is going to have to continue to support them. And I, I think that's what the distributed training is as well. They also talked about you can now automatically use different sources for training as you step through a various SageMaker capabilities like Snowflake, MongoDB, and Databricks are what they're talking about. And I've got to admit that it seems a little disingenuous to me that magically the secret sauce that makes machine learning go is having an awful lot of data and gathering ever more data, and that's what it needs to churn on. And this is brought to us by AWS, a company that charges per gigabyte month. Uh, I feel like they're hoping that it's not just experience for which there is no compression algorithm. They're making a mint selling shovels into a gold rush. What I haven't heard yet is customer stories about, so we used machine learning and made a crap ton of money out of, as a result, it's an awesome viable business model. Like that's the only thing machine learning can't find in your data. Yes, uh, as I say, we had a beautiful machine learning model, we had a beautiful data model, we just never came up with a business model. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people are still struggling with that, right? But you know, it's, it is early days yet. So I, I think it's reasonable to provide a, um, a, a little bit of uh, just sit back and, and watch the process play out. Um, but that does bring up, I think, the, the next service uh, that we might want to talk about, which is the release of, of Clarify. I guess it's more of a feature than a service, right, for SageMaker, which is answering the question, look, we've spent all this time rolling out these features. How do we actually make sure they're not making everything worse? Right. I would argue that a lot of these things should be features instead of services. I mean, originally SageMaker was, how do I frame this? Uh, don't take this as anything being dismissive, but it was Fisher Price for machine learning. I'm not a data scientist, but I want to dive into things. And that was super approachable for people who had no formal data science training. Now you have 40 services, all named SageMaker, and it's incredibly complicated and confusing. Forget getting a master's degree in math to understand this. I also need to get a PhD in AWS service taxonomy. But yeah, Clarify is awesome if it works. On the other hand, I question whether it's going to be allowed to work. The whole point of machine learning in some shops is bias laundering, where, oh, I can put all of my biases through these and then just blame the algorithm instead of being a garbage fire of a person or a company. Facebook, sorry. The challenge though, is that by calling it Clarify first, it's called that because Amazon PR is going to spend the next month clarifying exactly what this thing does and doesn't do. Two, how does it enter the process? Where does it start? Where does it stop? If you train it on, I don't know, board members of the Fortune 500, is it going to say, hey, that's 87% white dudes? Or is it just going to wait until after everything's done and then you start running it on other stuff and then it complains? Ah, your current set has a different set of biases. It is only 70% white dudes. Might want to take a look at that. It, it has the potential to theoretically make things worse depending upon implementation. But I'm hesitant to say that this solves the bias problem. If anything, it feels it'll give people a hall pass. There are doctors who spend their entire career focused squarely on aspects of algorithmic bias. I don't think, well, we released a service, we're done, is going to solve it. Right. And there's a couple of things there. I mean, what, what do they say? Uh, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. That's been a problem in machine learning for a while. And I, I think one of the ways AWS is trying to get out in front of that is by actually open sourcing the key uh, bias detection algorithm that they're using inside of Clarify. And they're doing that. Uh, it's available now. You can find it on GitHub. It's a, it's a Python package. Is it you know, likely inadequate? Probably. But of course, that's the history 
of AWS services in general, they release in a very prototype state. That's been true of many services we've seen this reinvent as well as in years past. Um, we know yes. that that I doesn't mean, mean there won't be future wanna... investment in the service, right? Oh yeah. One thing I do want to call out that Amazon's gotten a bit of flag for, people are digging up the old article where they wrote an internal tool at Amazon to screen resumes and discovered that it was recommending people who looked a lot like existing members of staff, namely heavily biased for white dudes. Now, Amazon did the right thing about this by, wow, that's horrifying and killed the program. I don't see that being shamed for doing the right thing in this case is necessarily in anyone's interest. I, yeah, occasionally I built things that did horrifying things. Granted, not atrocities, unless you really have strong opinions about Python indentation, but still bad things and ooh, we shouldn't let it do that anymore is the right answer as opposed to doubling down and declaring you're smarter than everyone else. Facebook, sorry, allergies today. Yes, and, and uh, of course, Google's been in the news recently, unfortunately, for uh, firing an, an AI ethics researcher, uh, apparently for, uh, you know, findings that, that didn't justify the, the AI things that they wanted to do. So, it, you know, saying that you're going to establish an ethics commission or open sourcing your bias detection algorithm is one thing, proving that you're going to follow up on that, right, is another thing. Um, again, this is new. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and hopefully there will be those eyeballs on that algorithm to make sure that it's doing something, but that it's doing the right thing. Yes, it is absolutely a good start. It is not a solution, and I am willing to suspend judgment other than making fun of the service name because apparently I bring more creativity to a typical live streaming session than AWS's entire naming department has for the past 15 years. Yes, uh, I think there's a few service names we could riff on as part of this uh, session. The, the one that I... I really cracked me up when it came out was actually AWS Proton. If you Googled AWS Proton before last Tuesday, what you would find is a glossary term from the original AWS, AWS.org, the American Welding Society. Um, you can find the Proton page at AWS.org, which really makes me wish that we offered welding training at A Cloud Guru. We'll have to get there. What I wonder is if someone wound up doing some analyses and figured out, okay, which AWS terms are we not number one for SEO for? We're going to take those terms and launch a service named after that thing. We know this is true as soon as they wind up launching AWS welding, which who knows, there's still, you know, eight more weeks of reInvent or however the hell long it is to go. So we may be speaking too soon. I mean, hey, there's an Azure Arc. So, you know, basically they've got a competitor already. So they also talked about deep profiling for SageMaker debugger. Uh, I don't think it's profiling in the same sense of as algorithmic bias, but the idea, to my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, chat or forest, is that it does some analysis around what the training run looks like, what the implementation run looks like, or it winds up fine giving you insights to which you can use to fine tune your SageMaker runs. This is the problem. At some point, there are so many subservices, I could just blatantly make it up and no one's going to call me on it because who the hell knows? Right. And, and of course, the other piece of that is I, I, I actually can't speak for the service you just mentioned or the feature you just mentioned, but a lot of these features are at this point announced as they're coming at some point in the future. So you actually can't look at them and see what they do today, right? It's Q1 of, of 2021 or possibly much later. Right. Someone is clearly getting bonused on number of announcements they make in any given keynote, and that's not necessarily the best for customers. Uh, speaking of something that is clearly not for me, you've got the SageMaker Edge Manager, which feels like it was a subservice stolen from Systems Manager because they like repeating Manager again. Uh, to be more on brand, I would probably have named this one SageMaker Edge Maker. But the whole point there is that it manages and monitors AI models across fleets of smart devices. I would say that I don't have any of those around here, but I have so many echoes that my house is borderline haunted. Yes, uh, you know, and this really uh, is a trend that we've seen throughout reInvent, right? With the investment in edge technologies. We saw a bunch of them in the last Tuesday's keynote uh, with Monotron and uh, Panorama. And uh, there's another top level service whose name I can't even think of right now uh, th that are all based on, you know, managing systems at the edge, monitoring systems at the edge, uh, collecting data from systems at the edge. It's clear that, you know, AWS thinks that this is a, something where there's there's a lot of value for them, right, and for customers, but also a way for them to expand beyond the, the four walls of their cloud, if you will, without having to say the dreaded word multi-cloud, if they just keep repeating edge long enough. A couple of comments from the Twitch chat, please keep them coming. Uh, first, someone asked, there's a naming department? Yes, there are several bars in Seattle, some of them quite divey. Uh, there's uh, Ben chimes in with the original uh, 
fam, that's F A capital M capital L Y name was pretty creative. Though having an AWS family service isn't great either. You're right. There already is an AWS family service. It's called reInvent because if you don't believe that going to Las Vegas for a week and spending all your time talking about cloud right after Thanksgiving has a burden on your family, then I would challenge what your life looks like. And of course, our dear friend Mark Nunikoven, uh, also known as Bet You Can't Spell This, uh, says that all the SageMaker services or services are really just part of what SageMaker is, the visual studio of machine learning model creation. Uh, I would argue that you're not far from wrong there. It's, it does seem like it's moving, tripping, schlepping in the direction of becoming a full IDE for machine learning. I think it's challenging to get up and running with it. So far, the best ML experiments I've done have been on GCP. Because, not because they necessarily have the best service necessarily, I don't know enough to judge that, but I know that going through the training and onboarding and working with a notebook someone published didn't make me feel dumb and it just worked. There's something to be said for that. Yes, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And to the point about SageMaker being a family of features as opposed to a bunch of top-level services, isn't that what we'd rather have AWS doing going forward as opposed to creating perhaps half a dozen or a dozen top-level services that are closely related but you know have a lot of the same uh, functionalities that overlap with each other? This is a big problem in developer tooling right now. I mean, can you articulate the difference between you know Code Suite and Code, or I should say Code Star, and can't even get them out right, right? Proton and SAM and SAR and all that. I think you might have even mentioned this, Corey, in a in a piece recently. Um, it, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? To have a whole thing under the same umbrella, whether that's systems manager or whether it's SageMaker, even if it does make for some long and confusing names. Right. The problem I have is that everything that they release needs to be accessible to folks who have no idea what the hell they're looking at. Because, spoiler, even people who've been using AWS for over a decade look at some aspects of this and have no idea what they're looking at. We've long since passed a point where I can make services up and not get called out by AWS employees. Or, worse, I'll mention actual AWS services and they think I'm messing with them. It, it has long since escaped the capability of most people to keep this stuff all in their head. Do you have any idea how long I spend every night with flashcards? My God. No, I, I completely believe, Corey, that you have this giant deck of flashcards next to your bed and, and just sort of shuffle them from one side to the other throughout the night. Um, but, you know, it, for people who do not have that, uh, it's it's a challenge, right? And the, the service I always go to as an example here is Lambda, which is one of my favorite services. I've been using it basically since it was launched. And I've been using it since it was launched because originally it was such a simple concept, right? You, you logged in and it, it did a very clear, simple set of things. It was actually constrained deliberately in ways like how long it could run and how uh, big the systems were that you could run on Lambda uh, and all that sort of thing. And gradually those um, constraints have eroded away and more and more stuff has been added. Even if you pop open that Lambda console today, you will see, right? There, there's just this never ending spate of features. And do I want to put this in a VPC? And do I want provision concurrency? Do I want to bring a container image? Or do I want to use a layer? Or do I want to use a custom runtime? Or do I just want to type this right up here in the console? I'm not ragging on the Lambda team. They've delivered a bunch of amazing features. And what they've done is they've made Lambda much more possible for a lot of enterprises and a lot of use cases that would never have been able to touch it back in you know, 2014, 2015. But at some point, you have to step back and go, am I looking at you know, a VCR circa 2005 here, right, where the feature creep slowly brought it to a point where almost nobody felt comfortable doing anything other than just kind of leaving back and, and pushing player pause. You know, if I were going to introduce a new person to AWS today, could I in good conscience tell them serverless is simple when they look at the AWS Lambda console and they see this never ending rolling slate of features? I'm not sure that I could. And that's concerning to me. No, when I first started with Lambda, it was great. It was an entire environment and a service defined by its constraints. And it forced me to build in certain patterns that aligned with the way it quote unquote, should be done as per AWS. They've relaxed those constraints and increased capability to the point where now it's like, all right, this is on brand for my horse shit. I bet you I can run the Slack clients in it now that it's got 10 gigs of RAM and people start doing horrifying things. It's, it's not great. And I don't know how you get around this problem, but it's like every enhancement means, oh great, this unlocks three or four amazing use cases and a universe of horrible ones. And how do you, I'm not trying to be a service purist here, but how do you get there? 
Yeah, I, I don't think there is a clear answer. I think it's, it's some of it's inevitable. You know, it's the result of lots of service teams with lots of KPIs around shipping, right? And I mean, we've we've actually talked in just the course of these few minutes here about two totally diametrically opposed efforts that you see within AWS, one of which is to roll out a whole bunch of new features under one big service umbrella. And then there's the uh, idea of, of creating a whole bunch of different services where two is better than zero. Uh, and, and both of those have their drawbacks, right? Neither is perfect. So it's easy to, to sit here and criticize. Um, but ultimately, look, the, the way that we will get to where we need to be with these increasingly powerful and increasingly complex tools is through education and training, which is a great time for me to mention that there's a company called A Cloud Guru that will help you get there. Absolutely. And once again, thank you for sponsoring this ridiculous nonsense. It's appreciated. So let's focus on a different AWS. Let's focus for a minute on a different AWS core competency that ties us back to the keynote. And that competency is, of course, getting the living crap kicked out of its data warehouse by Snowflake. So they're in this place now of panicking like hell around what are we going to do to differentiate this? And their answer, as it is with everything these days, I know. I'm going to pour a whole bunch of machine learning on it. So Redshift now supports machine learning directly in the database because that sounds like a thing a database should do. Yeah, I'm making fun of Route 53 as a database should absolutely have been where the joke died. They took it too far. Yeah, and and look, I mean, uh, there's there's other features rolling out, or at least that have been announced for Redshift that are aiming to make it more competitive against the likes of Snowflake. I'm thinking of this. I think it's called Aqua. What is it? Advanced Query Accelerator, which is like a cache that's being rolled out for Redshift to to help make it more competitive performance wise against not only Redshift but the other big players in data warehousing. Um, I, I you know again we haven't seen it. We don't know what it looks like. We we don't know if these benchmarks are you know to, to what extent they've been tortured to tell us what we what AWS wants us to hear. But it's obviously an indication that AWS is feeling pressure, right, from uh, vendors who are all in on one service, making it the best that it can be. And that's going to be something to watch in the, the months and years ahead is uh, how is AWS going to continue to be competitive uh, when their strategy product-wise seems to be kind of worse is better, right? We'll take a initial version of something, we'll roll it out, and then we'll rely on our network effects to pull people in and give us feedback while we improve it. As more cloud providers and more standalone uh, SaaS providers like the data dogs of the world, like the snowflakes of the world, continue to provide other options, AWS is going to have to step up their game. And I, that seems to be what they're doing with Redshift. Competition makes everyone better. A uh, couple comments in the chat. Uh, Aunt Stanley says, never use the console. I'm going to disagree with you. The first time they, I look at a new service, I go and look at the console because that helps shape at least my understanding of how AWS envisioned the service being used, as opposed to the often inarticulate mumbling that they charitably call a launch announcement. It takes time to understand how this stuff is contextualized in the larger ecosystem. And very often the people building the service are super close to it and don't articulate their understanding of things. So the console is generally how I tend to understand these pieces. Now down the road, sure, you shouldn't be using this to deploy things to production. You should be using Terraform or CloudFormation or the CDK or far more commonly, you'll be using the console and then lying about it. A uh, couple of other comments from the chat. Uh, am I calling Jeff Barr inarticulate? Absolutely not. I'm talking the launch announcements in the What's New RSS feed that is written by the service team. And if you haven't gone in there, take a look at a few of them. You're in for a treat. Jeff Barr writes in a way that I can only aspire to. Let's be very clear on that. Yes, Jeff is, is fantastic. He's a true bar raiser, as I like to say. Uh, but uh, you, you bring up a great point around the way some of these services are messages. And I don't think there's any better example than Proton, which has come up a couple times already. If you look at the product page for AWS Proton, I think the uh, marketing slug at the top says something like automated deployment for containers and serverless applications, something like that. Um, and, and when that was announced, I think everybody kind of was like, what is this then? Is this like a stackery killer? Is this a you know, amplify? What, what is this that we're talking about here? And it quickly became clear. And what I say quickly is, is you know, the uh, wonderful AWS containers team, which built the feature immediately, like reeled off all these blog posts and videos and, and Twitter threads to try to help people make sense of it, to help them get past that initial messaging. It became clear that Proton is doing something relatively unique, which is, it's as I like to say, it's Conway's law as a service. And I had an article out about this today at ACG, uh, where it's, it's explicitly baking organizational assumptions into how you do your um, application delivery, where you have your central cloud team that creates environment and service templates. And then you hand those over the wall to your app dev teams who are supposed to have a pretty streamlined experience where they don't touch, touch all that nasty infrastructure automation. And we could argue all day about whether or not that's really a healthy pattern. But the point is that doesn't show up in the, in the marketing on the Proton page. You really have to dive in. You have to listen to other people to understand what the service does. So yeah. I think that is a problem.
Yeah, someone just asked, uh, co-pilot and proton seem to overlap. Thoughts? Yeah, I think a lot of things overlap. The whole problem is it's hard to say because Proton's announcement on stage was basically the executive level of a way to build and deploy software. And the launch announcements that were posted formally looked basically like code samples. And usually AWS has blog posts that sort of step into the gap between those two things that explain and contextualize it so folks understand where it's appropriate, where it's not, and then they can poke fun at various small minutia of it. That didn't seem to get out quite the, the way it normally does with Proton. So for the first day, I'm looking at that scratch in my head and, well, I'll have to explore that in more depth. I'll put it in the backlog, which at this point looks like February. Yes, that backlog is getting longer and longer, isn't it? I've got uh, a whole list of, of things I need to dive into that I'm definitely not going to get to before Christmas. No, absolutely not. Uh, moving on. Uh, fortunately, they also decide that if they're going to spread ML over Redshift, they could also do this to other services as experiments that no one's actually using, specifically Amazon Neptune. What is a graph database? Nobody knows, but we feel dumb admitting that in public. So, oh yeah, we use Neptune for all kinds of things. It might even be a floor polish. We don't know. But they now have Neptune ML. Yeah, those are two words that I probably wouldn't be comfortable going anywhere near in a conjoined context. Um, I, I you feel know, like the, the service the name that was being developed was AWS Here Be Dragons. Very well might be. That would actually be a lot cooler and probably would get more people to try it than just Neptune ML. But, you know, I think the most, uh, the, the most significant public facing use case I've seen for Neptune recently was AWS's like diagram generator thing that came out a couple of months ago. Did you see this? It was it was a, a reference architecture that was put out by I think maybe a ProServe team or a solutions architect team where they are giving you a way to uh, intuit from your deployed infrastructure a, a graph of your services, an infrastructure service graph. And they use Neptune for that possibly so there would be a public use case for Neptune, but I haven't heard of a lot of actual customers using it. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it's great in theory and uh, not terrific in practice. It's coincidentally, uh, theory and practice are the names of my staging and production environments. And, but that's just because of my own personal foibles. It works in theory, but not in practice means that's right, works on my machine. Uh, SageMaker Autopilot now integrates with more data sources and BI tools. I like that they have, they've integrated for a long time with QuickSight, but now they're integrating with Tableau because Tableau has customers. And I say that angrily because I want QuickSight to work. I like the pricing. I like the integration with things. I don't like the, you know, actual utility as a BI tool. I don't like paying Tableau enterprise pricing and every year it's contract negotiation. It feels like, oh good, time for another shakedown. I would love to migrate away from Tableau. I just want QuickSight to be better than it is. QuickSight team, please call me. To totally agree with that. I, I, uh, I think QuickSight is so interesting because it's such a bigger opportunity than just uh, you know, whatever business analysts or whoever you think is the classic use case for that tool. Uh, anybody who needs to create reports, right? And, and increasingly, I mean, that's your, your DevOps team. It's anybody who's, who's using AWS services that's, think about things people are using like CloudWatch logs for today that could be better put into a service like QuickSight. We did what we call a, a Cloud Guru Challenge recently here at ACG, where we put out these spec-based projects and we have people uh, go down the Google rabbit holes to, to figure them out. And, and the one we did uh, a little earlier this fall was all based around working with uh, COVID-19 data. And one of the requirements was you had to eventually surface that through a BI type tool. Could could be QuickSight, could be Tableau, could be Look or something like that. A lot of people wanted to use QuickSight, ended up running into technical limitations with the tool and having to go outside the AWS garden, not that they wanted to, right? Because they were building pretty much everything else in AWS. That's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for AWS to, to bring those folks back in. And I certainly look forward to seeing them put some more investment in that service and make it happen. Yeah, I'm optimistic, but we'll see what happens. Uh... Also, speaking of missing opportunities, Amazon Kendra uh, launched Intelligent Search. Cool, that's sort of the point of it, I thought, but all right. Uh, so, sorry, that it is Intelligent Search. It's explaining what it is for people that don't, you know, automatically associate various business capabilities with random women's names. Uh, but it include, announced 40 plus new connectors and incremental learning. Cool. Kendra is enterprise search appliance. And by enterprise, I mean it costs 7,500 bucks a month to start, which means that it's not for me. It may not be for you. And by the time it is for you, you probably already have something else in place. It feels like a lost opportunity because I have data that lives everywhere, Slack, 15 other things. I started, after someone recommended it to me this week, I started playing around with a tool called Command E, which integrates with a bunch of different APIs. And oh my God, it's starting to work. And I can query email, calendar, things on disk, et cetera. That's super exciting. 
But that's what I was hoping Kendra would be when it was announced, and it was not, unless your life effectively runs on more money than you know what to do with. But if it does, you're not going to be running Kendra. You're going to be doing some more machine learning. Well, right. And that takes us very back to the first observation in this live stream, which is not every AWS service is for everyone. And you might not be able to fathom turning on like Macy, right, in your environment. But I suppose there's a customer out there with a uh, tolerance for billing where, where it makes sense to run that. You know, if, if the cost of running it is, is less than the cost of a massive breach, uh, that's why these services exist. Presumably. it's The problem is, is an awful lot of launches uh, that AWS puts out are not great at launch. And so people try them, they get annoyed, they write them off, and they don't go back to relearn something. Because once you know something, why would you ever revisit that opinion? I mean, this is the problem Microsoft had for the last decade. Like, surprise, we're not assholes mostly to anyone anymore, but it's taken this long for people to stop reflexively cringing when the word Microsoft was mentioned. If you'd asked me at the beginning of that transformation, I would have bet you anything it wasn't possible, but they did. With AWS services, they don't get enough attention because there's so many other services. Oh yeah, I tried that thing three years ago, it was crap, means I'm not gonna give it a fair shake now that it's been fleshed out better. I mean, Corey, I think really the question here is what's it gonna take to get you to reconsider your posture on Oracle licensing? Yeah, uh, my company rebrand for one, but I don't know what beyond after that, I couldn't tell you. It's, they burned an awful lot of bridges and I find that a lot of their employees on Twitter, uh, at least the rank and file, not necessarily the execs, are incredibly condescending. It's like, wow, based upon that response, it's clear that you A, think you work at Google and B, couldn't pass the tech interview. Good for you. It was, it just becomes a, a company that's difficult to like on a variety of different axes. But I wish them well. They seem to be doing good things in cloud. Hopefully they'll get another customer as soon as the president gets around to stealing one for them. And we'll see how that winds up evolving. I know there's precious little you can say to that that doesn't expose you to some form of liability. That's fine. Yes, Moving that's on. Right. Let's let's uh, the last big service announcement was apparently named after a sign on the factory floor. Amazon, look out for metrics. Uh, it doesn't have an exclamation point at the end of the formal name, but I will never write it without one, like Yahoo did formally. It where the hell did that service name come from? I mean, I think the same place that Lookout for Equipment came, right, and the other couple of Lookout-related services that came out. Um, I don't know. I think it's kind of catchy, and it's fun to say. It's fun to shout. Oh, oh, it absolutely is. Lookout for metrics. Lookout for equipment. Lookout for vision. It's great. It feels like a weird combination across the board of machine learning and IoT industrial stuff. So it's probably not for me unless I start instrumenting my house with a hell of a lot more cameras and sensors everywhere, which, you know, Next year, once uh, the second kid learns to wander around a bit more than the current uh, rolling around in her crib. But it, it's, again, not every service is for everyone. These are probably not for me, which means I'm just sitting here in the cheap seats making fun of a lot of very smart people's very hard work. There you go. Well, look, and, and I think it's important to underscore, uh, there's been some fantastic things rolled out over the past couple of weeks. And of course, we're looking forward to more. And, uh, you know, when, when uh, at least for me, when I'm, evaluating something that's come out and saying, oh, I really wish it would do this. That's because I really wish it would do that, which means that this service is scratching an itch, right? It's just, there's more there. And, uh, you know, it's coming from a place of excitement and hopefully positive uh, encouragement, so. We sure can hope so. So any questions from the chat that we can get to before we wind up calling this a stream? I'm thrilled to wind up addressing those slings and arrows, uh, but other stuff out there, there was the whole EKS, uh, sorry, ECS anywhere, EKS any who, but of course I pronounce them as Amazon does, uh, as X in both cases. So you have to spell it to know which one I'm talking about. That's right, Amazon X anywhere. You know, I, I you just lost me there. Exactly. They've lost me a long time ago. The idea now of running EKS or ECS on premises, which is how it's designed, and in other cloud providers, which is not anything they ever want to admit to in public or talk about, it's a neat idea. It, it winds up exposing ways of getting actual work done in, that doesn't require going back to building things yourself from, bare, from uh, first principles. It also doesn't necessarily become overly prescriptive about how and where workloads run. I think this speaks to a longer term evolution we're seeing with AWS as they start leaving the region and going out into you know, our environments or the edge as they like to dismissively call it. But it's, real role, it's a real position shift from them, isn't it? 
It, it really is. And uh, I think a lot of people miss this when they look at the announcement because they're like, oh, big deal. AWS has a managed uh, pane of glass for Kubernetes now. Azure's got that. Uh, Google's had that with Anthos for a while. You know, what's the big deal? This is AWS late to the party. But it really, I mean, because of the years that AWS has spent not only eschewing any uh, move toward multi-cloud, but even... Yes, thank you. Pro prohibiting their partners, right, from even using words like multi-cloud, any cloud, cross-cloud. As soon as I saw that word anywhere, I'm like, we couldn't say anywhere two years ago, you know, like anything with the word any in it, you, you couldn't say. It, that's, that's a huge shift in itself, even though they spent the whole keynote and all of the associated marketing material talking about hybrid cloud and edge and making sure that we knew that this was just for VMware and, and uh, your own bare metal. It wasn't certainly for anything on Azure and GCP, but it's been, it's been confirmed that they will support those workloads. And I mean, look, without any form of you know outside knowledge or anything whatsoever about this, it, it just seems clear from a pure market perspective that this is where things are going. Uh, large complex enterprises over time diversify in their choice of, of vendors. We know this. It happens via acquisition. Happens because they're hedging their bets. Happens because of you know service envy, where they want uh, this service on this cloud and that service on the other cloud. Or most commonly, it just happens because of simple lack of coordination. Right? Uh, nobody's making uh, unified decisions, and so ultimately you get a little bit of Azure, a little bit of AWS, a little bit of GCP, and a you know whole lot of confusion sprinkled around your organization. Uh, it's a good idea in a situation like that to have some sort of a comprehensive plan for how you're going to skill people up on those services. Again, would love to talk to you about that at a Cloud Guru. I can't recommend you folks uh, highly enough. Honestly, we wind up giving subscriptions to our staff as well. It's a no brainer. I'm a big fan of what you folks do, even when you don't pay me, but thank you for paying me. It's always appreciated. Uh, a couple questions from the PMAP gallery as well. Uh, specifically, uh, is anyone actually using local zones? Yes, uh, their launch partners were mostly media companies in Los Angeles who wanted to have render farms as close to their desk as humanly possible and anything that has a high degree of low latency. If you take a look at where other local zones are spinning up, you'll see that they tend to be in cities with prominent industries based there and you can start to unroll exactly who might be doing various things depending on where they tend to be. It's weird, we're, we're, by, we're specializing to a point where you look at a map and like, oh, that city, that's known for that particular thing. Once upon a time it was Detroit and auto, but the world's changed a little bit. Uh, someone else asked, there any announcements or sessions that I liked? Were there any? Yes, Farah, I do like some things, rarely. I think that GP3 for EBS volumes is transformative for customers. I think the EC2 Mac instances are great for what they pretend for the future. And as far as sessions go, I was basically blown away by a panel that Mylon led. Uh, what is it? Bold decisions in critical moments. I did a live tweet thread on that. Highly recommend you catch the replay. What about you, Forrest? What, is, what's, uh, what have you seen that have really changed your uh, position or where the guys have yeah, set up? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, well, first, since this is the ML keynote, I, I do need to make sure I highlight our in-house ML hero here at ACG, Keisha Williams, who has multiple ML-related sessions and dev chats over the course of reInvent. So be sure to check those out live or on demand. She's a fantastic speaker and has a way of really breaking these concepts down in a way that even non-ML gurus like myself can understand. So highly recommend checking that out. Aside from that, um, of course, I'm keeping an eye on the, the leadership sessions, right? And on the, uh, uh, the, the keynotes, uh, because those are, um, you know, they, they come around live and, and it's important to try to catch those when you can. I, I think uh, what I'm most following right now is just how much AWS is uh, doubling down on the themes and services of reInvent's past in, in this reInvent. Rather, I mean, you're not seeing a ton of uh, new top-level services come out this year. Maybe there will be a lot more to come in the week remaining, but if they haven't, we haven't seen them so far, I kind of doubt we're going to see a lot. Uh, but what we're seeing is they're making continued investments, obviously, in SageMaker, which we've been talking about today. They're making huge investments in uh, serverless and in bringing serverless to a wider audience through things like you know the, the larger uh, packaging sizes and, of course, the introduction of containers and uh, better tightly scoped billing. Uh, and, and they're moving that into the, uh, the, the very forefront of their keynote announcement. So it's obviously a, a key uh, strategic area for them. Uh, so, so watching where AWS is spending their energy on the announcements is something that I'm, that I'm really tracking. Yeah, a couple more questions. Uh, first, one of my top bill reduction tips. Uh, we already mentioned GP3, but I think what's clear and people need to do every year uh, across the board is when they launch a new service and you're excited about it, great. Read the billing page first. There are some sharp edges on these services and make sure you understand what you're going to be charged for. Sometimes they get it wrong in their system and start charging you hilariously large piles of money. But generally speaking, understand the billing model. It's not that complex until you get into weird edge cases. The 
somewhat related is, uh, am I seeing that the one millisecond billing in Lambda result in savings for my customers today? Yes and no. It's a brilliant plan because everyone's talking about it. People are nerd sniping on how much you're saving on Lambda. And you look at your Lambda bill for last month and it's 72 cents. Yes. Ooh, that dropped it closer to 50 cents. I don't care. Whenever you see big Lambda spend, and I think my uh, record with one of my customers was around 50 or $60,000 a month, but they're spending millions on EC2 in the same time frame. It's it's absolutely useful and helpful for them, but it isn't transformative. It is not materially moving the needle on any workload I have seen. If you have a different story, please reach out. I won't name you. I just want to know that it actually exists and isn't just something set up there to, to have people distract me all the time with the question. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's the danger of percentages, right? If, if you're optimizing on a pure percentage basis and not keeping the entire picture in, in scope, you, you may be focusing on a, a tiny piece of the picture. And it's it's always cracks me up in these uh, announcements too, right? Where we hear about, you know, Aurora being the fastest growing database in the world or whatever the case may be, or, you know, all these new customers that are using SageMaker. Like if all you're hearing is percentages, you always take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Chad asks, is it weird that we're seeing during a year with a global pandemic and there isn't more focus from AWS on providing tools to solve the problem of climate and health for the future? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I have a few. I, I think my initial reaction is just, we've not seen AWS provide that high level of solutions for any problem domain yet. I mean, we know that they're making some initial partnerships in the area of healthcare, Amazon is as a whole, but that hasn't really showed up at AWS. Uh, so from in that sense, it doesn't surprise me. We have seen some open source efforts and they are, we know they're partnering with some uh, individual you know, companies and vendors to help create solutions and dashboards, that kind of thing. But I, I wouldn't say uh, strategy wise that I'm, that I'm surprised. AWS just isn't there at a, at a problem domain level. What, what would you say, Corey? I would mostly agree with what you're saying. Uh, I would also chime in that they're trying. I mean, they have Comprehend Medical out there. They have HealthLake that was just announced. But beyond that, first, it feels like the, the product planning cycle is more than nine months from inception to release. And two, it's a hard marketing challenge. And I've got a lot of respect for the folks in AWS marketing for mostly successfully threading this needle because it's incredibly easy to come across as building a tool to help solve the problem with a pandemic. You're not a charity, so you've got to sell it. And now you look like you're profiting off of a disaster. And that looks terrible. I mean, we're seeing a microcosm of that right now in the security space with FireEye announcing their breach yesterday. Security companies who even touch on it are getting castigated for you, you aren't supposed to use other people's breaches to sell stuff. But if you don't talk about it, and you have something that can help. What do you do? It's a difficult messaging needle to thread. And I, I have a, I get a lot of latitude for this. Like if you look at COVID-19 and the way that some companies go on and on about it, like it's a marketing campaign of theirs, it really rings hollow. It really does. I think there's a flip side of that where, to some extent, we've all been dealing with this for so long, you know, that, uh, I mean, if someone's got realistic solutions to make this better, then sure, I'm going to listen. Uh, but yeah, you're exactly right on the product cycle. I mentioned the open source repo for SageMaker Clarify earlier. When I looked at that today, the first commit was in April of this year. That's how long the cycle is on these things. This didn't just happen yesterday, right? And I'm sure you know, it was planned well before that. So yeah, I mean, maybe re 2021, we see a whole new class of services that are aimed at maybe not solving COVID exactly, because hopefully it'll be mostly behind us by then, you know, but uh, the, the next class of uh, health and public health epidemiology uh, genetics type of challenges that we know we're going to face in the next decade. Yeah, uh, people mentioned there were a bunch of announcements today around data and uh, what was it, data? There were some serverless announcements as well. Uh, I haven't caught up mostly on what's going on. I've been in back-to-back -back meetings getting yelled at by various people. Uh, have you seen anything uh, come out today of note? Uh, the, it's a good question because I've, I've got to go write my um, uh, my email summary for tomorrow. But uh, the, the big one that's floated across my radar so far is EMR Studio. Um, I've seen some boldly negative reactions to that, but have not looked into it yet. Uh, as usual, my guess would be this is something that's you know uh, likely very V1 prototype uh, in nature, so it may not be wise to expect too much from it. But um, I'll, I'll do my best to dive in and, and have some thoughts out there by morning. Yeah, EMR on, uh, on EKS is super fascinating in that 
A lot of my EMR customers are sort of tied into this le in a legacy sense. For those who aren't familiar, uh, EMR is Elastic MapReduce. MapReduce is based on the MapReduce paper that Google put out uh, many years ago as a prank and Yahoo fell for hook, line, and sinker and helped build Hadoop. And these days, most of the big data analytics stuff is happening through stream processing, not through querying things at rest, but through MapReduce. But an awful lot of workloads were built around this and those things have become monolithic and expensive and very difficult to migrate. So Anything that helps, I guess, break free some of that ossified infrastructure around EMR is a win in my book. I'm optimistic to see how that works out once it gets in customers' hands. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one more comment to make about the pace of announcements throughout this reInvent is uh, it's, you know, I, I guess I would have expected less in the first week keynote and then more sort of a steady pace. But I, I think to some extent, it feels like AWS has kept the same pace from previous reInvents with a, a great big Tuesday keynote, and we have to assume there will be some things saved for uh, Werner's keynote next week. But in, in between, it's, it's definitely been a drip, right? Which has been nice because it's given a little more time to assimilate and look at these things. Still, certainly more than you could ever hope to uh, get up to speed on in the time frame allowed. But I think overall, the extended period has had some positives in that respect. What do you think? I think that we're definitely, we see these weird uh, stops and starts. In fact, when I was building out the schedule for Requinvent, I had no idea what to expect. Was it going to be just a few releases and then silence? It turns out that we're hitting an almost every other weekday cadence for the big stuff, but there's still enough stuff to make sure that I wind up capturing a lot of this stuff. Uh, oh, someone, uh, Aunt, Aunt Stanley's trying to track me here with, uh, with both Google and Facebook now facing antitrust lawsuits. Do I think Amazon is in danger of an antitrust suit themselves? And do I think AWS could be forced to split out? I think that compared to those other two companies, AWS is, or Amazon as a whole is way better at interfacing with elected officials uh, as opposed to the we're smarter or we're barely human, depending on which of those two companies that you talk about, the attitudes that they convey. I think it would be better for the entire industry on some level if AWS and Amazon were not the same entity. It would make my job easier so I could don't have all the Amazon retail announcements getting dragged into my feeds, but that seems a weird reason to break a company up. Where do you stand on that? I've been very publicly uh, vocal about the fact that I think AWS and Amazon need to split up and also that I don't see any realistic chance of that happening anytime soon just because of the way the two companies are intertwined uh, financially. But it, look, I mean, you've got whole segments of industries and, and a growing section who are not wanting to make deep commitments to AWS because they don't want to be indirectly bankrolling their competitor in Amazon. Uh, that list of people is only going to grow as Amazon diversifies into more sectors. Uh, then you have all of the distractions that can come in when Amazon, the company, does something that AWS gets blamed for. I've sat in you know summits uh, where a keynote gets interrupted by protesters against Amazon retail. You know, there's there's no reason that that should be happening. It's it's just a distraction. Uh, I, but again, I I don't think it's realistic to expect anything anytime soon. Unfortunately, so we just kind of have to keep suffering through it. Right. Yeah, I've been in those same keynotes. I'd rather they get distracted for relevant things like systems manager, session managers, terrible name. That I want to see protesters for, or their mispronunciation of AMI. That's a big one too. Um, Someone also asked, do we have any guesses as to what's still to launch? That's a losing game, as it turns out, when you're sufficiently plugged into what AWS is doing. Because if we guess and we get it wrong, we look ridiculous. And if we get it right, no one will believe that we didn't break an NDA somewhere. That's my take on it. Forrest? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, I, I think I, I made a mistake of doing this earlier this year when I started talking about how oh, AWS is, is totally going to release some kind of multi-cloud tool. I had no inside knowledge about that. I was just going off uh, some some things that I had read in the uh, in the media. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was right. But you know, it's a, no one believes that you didn't know something. I, I promise I didn't. Uh, so good lesson for the future. Just keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Uh, ben, yeah, I hear you. Uh, ben Brits brings up the New York summit. One was about, first was about ICE. Uh, 2019 was, 2018 was someone very confused about Amazon selling racist stuff on the retail site. I'm trying to remember yes, what year it was which. But yeah, that, this is the problem too. I'd, I'd like to be able to split out mentally uh, which atrocities, which business unit is responsible for here. So I can at least yell at the right people about the right things in the right context. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, to, to bring up Amazon and Oracle one last time, there's like a 50% chance that anybody who's still running a large Oracle cluster is a supervillain. Um, but you, you don't see Oracle getting picketed just because they're, they don't have that public name recognition association uh, like Amazon does with AWS. 
Oh, absolutely. It's Oracle Who is the common case. Now, they're trying to fix that by uh, buying TikTok or stealing TikTok, but there's a whole, I, I don't know if they're ready to really go full on public with something that becomes a household name. That's never been their brand. And again, managing the tides of public opinion is something I'm certainly not good at. I have nothing but respect for people who can pull it off, but it, it just feels like a losing game across the board. Anything else you want to comment on before we wind up calling this a show? You know, it's been great to chat with you as always, Corey. There's a lot of reInvent it left really to go has. somehow. So I'm looking forward oh, to that. God. Definitely head over to uh, A Cloud Guru. We've got uh, swag we're giving out each day of reInvent and lots of analysis and other things. So uh, head over there. I'll, I'll have a link to that on my Twitter. And um, yeah, happy reInvent, everyone. Stay safe out there. Yeah. Visit A Cloud Guru. Highly recommend. Love the training. Uh, love the videos that I'm in for the most part. But, you know, that's just my own ongoing love affair with the sound of my own voice. Forrest, thanks again. Awesome. Thanks, Corey. Great to see you.